Good to be here with you again. We're going to talk about Matthew 24 again. <laughs> Last part of this chapter. Um, and we talked about this two times so far. <laughs> well, we talked about the first part of it as we we're answering the questions that uh, the disciples ask Jesus. Now, it was four disciples that asked him the questions. Uh, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him the questions, but all the disciples were listening. And he answered the questions for all the disciples, but the four disciples asked him specifically these questions. Now, the questions that he asked, they asked were, when will these things be? Talking about the destruction of the temple. Because remember, he specifically pointed out that that temple was going to be destroyed. And then the second question that was, they asked was, when was the end going to be? And when were all those things going to happen? So we're going to answer the second question today, hopefully. Because, again, I'm not going to make any predictions. Because <laughs> I don't do that. <laughs> I don't predict anything. Number one, I can't. Number two, Jesus already did it. So why should I do something that Jesus already did? Amen? Amen. If he already did it, why should I do it? Okay? And he did it perfectly, so anything I do is not going to be perfect. So, you know, let's just go on with that. He answers the question... And you can imagine when they looked at all of this edifice, this, this beautiful edifice, because Herod's temple was a beautiful thing. Now, you can imagine if you had seen Solomon's temple. If you'd looked at Solomon's temple, if you'd been lucky enough to be there and seen Solomon's temple, Solomon's temple was a beautiful thing. In fact, you could have seen it from the distance far away because it was this beautiful white building up on top of this temple mount in Jerusalem. Beautiful white building with all of this gold around it. And of course, when the sun bounced off of that thing, it would just lit it up. Well, Herod had, had remodeled Zerubbabel's temple because Solomon's temple had no longer existed because Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed Solomon's temple. And so when the first exiles came back from Babylon in 539, they began to rebuild the temple with materials that Cyrus the Great had provided for them. But there was a lot of upheaval around them, so they only laid the foundation and they got discouraged, so they started building their own houses. Well, then Ezra and Nehemiah and some other prophets got on them through the Lord. And Zerubbabel, with some other exiles that they brought back, began to rebuild the temple and lay the foundation for the temple, and they rebuilt the temple. Well, it was that temple, the temple that Zerubbabel rebuilt, that Herod began to remodel. And he began to remodel this thing, and he began to lavishly rebuild, because Herod never did anything halfway. Herod began to pull columns on the thing, and colonnades on the thing, and buildings on the thing. And he covered that whole temple mount with buildings and building. And it was a beautiful thing. It was gorgeous. And so the disciples looked at this thing, and it was just immaculate. It was beautiful. It was gorgeous. And here's Jesus saying, you see this thing? I tell you, there's not going to be one stone of this thing left upon another. And you can almost hear 
when he says this thing, you can almost hear 12 jaws hit the pavement. Boom. You've got to be kidding. You've got to be kidding. Because that was their landmark. That was their identification. That was their existence. That was their God. That was their religion. That was their nationality. That was their everything. And you're telling me that this is going to be destroyed? There's not going to be one stone left upon it. Not, nevertheless, that it was Herod, this godless king, that had rebuilt the thing. It was their existence. It was their identity. It was their God. Their God lived there. And it's going to be destroyed. Jesus, when is this going to happen? And he begins in verse 36 of that 24th chapter, and he says, Concerning that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, except the Father only. As the days of Noah were, so the coming of the Son of Man will be. For in those days, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah boarded the ark. They didn't know until the flood came and swept them all away. So this is the way the coming of the Son of Man will be. He's answering now the second question. When will the end come? And when will these things be? Nobody knows the hour, but it will be sudden. It will be coming. In a speech made in 1863, Abraham Lincoln said, We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power, as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. Too proud to pray to God that made us. Sitting president in the midst of the greatest and most destructive war we have ever fought. the most casualties of any war that we have ever fought. The sitting president made that speech almost 160 years ago, and he had his finger on the pulse of his nation. And I submit to you this morning, beloved, 160 years ago, he had his finger on the pulse of the nation today. And the sitting president today that can't even carry his hat. We have grown in numbers and wealth and power as no other nation has grown. We have forgotten God. We have got, forgotten the gracious hand that has preserved us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all of these blessings have been produced by us. By us. 
that we are the producers of our own fate. We do not feel the necessity or the need for God. And we certainly do not pray to him. And I'm talking about the church. Nonetheless, society. We have forgotten the God who saved us and preserved us by his grace. Jesus said all these things are going to happen. They're going to happen. In verse 34, and we need to cling to his words as our security. Verse 35, we need to cling to those words as our security because they are truth, amen? They're going to happen. And God's good news, his gospel must get everywhere. It must go everywhere, amen? We've been charged with the message of the good news to take it everywhere, amen? amen? To take it throughout the world. And what role do we need to play in touching the lives of our neighbors and our world with the gospel? What role do I need to play in touching the lives of my neighbor with the gospel? So they may come to faith in Jesus Christ. What role must God's church be everywhere helping people to come to faith in Jesus Christ? Church, we need to wake up. We've been idle too long. We've been enjoying our success far too long. We've been asleep far too long. Our nation is dying and going to hell. And they're going to hell happily. While we've been asleep doing nothing. Enjoying our ease. What if God took away your building? What if God took away your seats? What if God took away your air conditioning? What would you do? Would you go home and sit in front of your television and watch it on TV? What would you do if God put you back on the street to lead people to Jesus Christ? That's what he did in the first century. Go ye therefore into all the world, teaching all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. Teaching them to observe all things which I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen? Amen. And the disciples got comfortable in Jerusalem, teaching and preaching the word of God. Oh yeah, they won a few converts. Amen? They won 3,000 on one, 5,000 on another. Amen? Amen? And then came Saul, breathing hellfire and damnation. Because God sent persecution into their midst because they were not doing what he told them to do, and that was to go into all of the world and to teach all nations. Amen? Amen. And persecution came into their midst, and they had to get out of their ease and start doing what he told them to do. And then when the persecution accomplished the task that he went, sent it to accomplish, he converted Saul. Amen? And then Saul went to all of the nations. Amen? Amen? 
You see, when you stay on your bed of ease, God may send persecution into your midst. God may take away your building. God may take away your bed of ease. God may take away your stuff in order to get you to do what he told you to do. God took away their building. Beloved, there's not going to be one stone you see left upon another. I'm going to take away your identity. I'm going to take away this house where you think I dwell because I don't dwell in buildings made with stone. I dwell in a tent, amen, where I can go where the people go, amen. Where I am Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. God with his people. I go where the people go. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit. Amen. God's not in a building made with hands. David said, I want to build you a house. God said, I don't need a house. I'm perfectly willing to dwell in a tent. I'm happy in the tent. Why? Because you can pick up the tent and you can move it. <laughs> Once you, once you nail down that first rock, I'm a goner. Why? Because you're going to start worshiping that thing instead of me. Amen? Isn't that what happened? They started worshiping the rock instead of worshiping God. Do you worship your building made with hands? Or do you worship the God? Who provided it all for you? Who provided it all for you? God's people should work everywhere, striving to advance God's interest in public justice, in housing, in environment, in health. What are you doing about that? What are you doing in those areas? That's Jesus' agenda. That's his interest. 25th chapter. Did you go to the naked with clothing? Did you go to the jail? Did you offer a cup of cold water in my name? Did you go to the sick? Did you go to the hungry? Because if you went to one of those... In my name, it's as if you did it unto me. See, God's people need to work everywhere because the church will be taken up. See, the church is going to be taken up before all of this takes place because we're going to be raptured before the tribulation takes place. We're going to be gone before the tribulation takes place. We're going to be out of here. Now God's still going to work. God's still going to save people. During the tribulation period. There are going to be tribulation saints. Now they're not going to have beds of ease like we've got. They're going to have it tough. Because they're, during that period of time, you're going to know it's going to be tough. Notice he says here, secondly, that one will be taken, one will be left in verses 40 through 41. One will be taken, one will be left. He urged his followers to be ready and waiting for his return. Now, why is that important? Why is spiritual preparation so important for the believer? Well, spiritual preparation is commanded by God, isn't it? Aren't we to be spiritually prepared? Doesn't God tell us to be spiritually prepared? To be spiritually prepared in every situation? Paul wrote to, be, wrote to Timothy, he said, be prepared in every situation to give a testimony. Amen? To be, be prepared. You ought to be prepared in every situation to give your testimony. In fact, you ought to be able to give your testimony in 90 seconds. 
Now, I don't mean you ought to be able to start from your, uh, from your spiritual rebirth and give every point that went through your mind through today. How did I realize I was a sinner? How did I realize I needed Jesus? What did I do to, to operate that? And what am I doing now? Boom, 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 boom. Four points. All you need to tell somebody how to come to Jesus. all you need. Now, after they come, if you want to tell them all your stuff, okay, if they've got time. For some of us, that may take days. But if you're in the airport going from here to there, or your uh, Paige Patterson used to tell how he would talk to people, he'd be, he'd be sitting in an airplane and he'd be sitting beside somebody and he'd strike up a conversation and somebody would ask him, well, what do you do? He said, I work for my father. We turn goats into sheep. Amen? Isn't that what you do? You turn goats into sheep. Amen? And the father said, the goats are going to the left and the sheep are going to the right. Amen? Okay? We turn goats into sheep by sharing the message of the gospel. Amen? Amen. We're about our Father's business to turn goats into sheep. Okay? And you can do that in 90 seconds. And so, spiritual preparation commanded by God, He told them about His return not to stimulate them to do predictions and start doing their charts and start doing their predictions and start doing their, when's he coming, when's he coming, when's he coming, when's he coming? Do you understand why Jesus didn't tell us when he was coming back? You know why he didn't tell us when he was coming back? How many of you took college? How many of you had to write college papers? Now, I know what you did. I know. You waited till two days before that paper had to be in. And then you wrote like mad to get that 25-page paper done. Didn't you? Mm-hmm. You had the whole semester to write that paper. But you waited till two days before that paper was done. And you wrote 25 pages. I mean, night and day, night and day, night and day. That's why Jesus didn't tell us when he was coming back. Because we'd fritter it away, we'd fiddle around, we'd doodle-diddle until two days before he came back. <laughs> and then we'd run around trying to win as many people as we could to Jesus before he came back. And now you know you do that. You know that's true. That's why he didn't tell us. Because that's what he knew would happen. Because he knew us as human beings. Amen? Amen. And he knew that's exactly what we would do. So he didn't tell us when he was coming back. He said, you need to be prepared. And in the preparation, he said, you don't make charts. You just need to prepare. So the only safe choice is to obey him. And be prepared for the minute, for the second. Spiritual preparation is active. He asks us to spend time waiting, taking care of his people, providing for his people, trying to win, lead as many people. Uh, I, I need to correct that. You don't win anybody. You don't win a soul. Amen? You lead people to Christ. You don't win anybody. God wins them to himself. You simply lead them to Jesus. All you do, folks, is do what? You plant the seed. That's all you do. All you are is seed planters. You just plant the seed. God cultivates. God waters, 
And God draws the net when the net's ready. When this crop's ready, God reaps, doesn't he? He says he sends his angels to reap. Amen? He reaps. Why? Because he's the only one that knows the heart of the individual. Amen? I don't know their heart. I'd make too many mistakes. Amen? That's why I don't ever tell anybody, you're saved. I never tell a person, you're saved. Because I don't know their heart. I don't know whether they're saved or not. Now, I'm a fruit inspector. I can inspect their fruit. As Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit. Now, I can be a fruit inspector, but I can't tell them whether they're saved or lost. Only God can do that. Because he can see their heart. He knows whether their heart is changed. And so I need this in preparation. I need to take care of the people doing the work on earth that he's sent me to do. And that was to plant the seed and to go talk to people with the gospel. Share the gospel in preparation of his return. It's focused on Christ's commands. Amen. Spiritual preparation is focused on his commands. And his command was go to share, to teach, to train. And that should motivate us to always be prepared. Not to live irresponsibility, sitting and waiting, doing nothing. We need to constantly be on the work. Christians have been entrusted with Christ's teachings and the apostles' doctrines based on those teachings. The one found doing God's will. And specific tasks assigned by the Master will be given that well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. Third thing he talked about here was faithfulness is not found in sitting and waiting, but actively doing. Now, this is going to be going on after the church leaves. So the church is going to be gone. Now, this activity is during the tribulation period. And you notice they will carry on with life as if nothing has happened, though many of their friends and relatives have disappeared. Now there's going to be, there's going to be an uproar because we don't know how many that's going to be. We don't know how many people are going to disappear with that rapture as the church leaves. Because we don't know how many folks are saved, amen? But it's going to create... People looking around, people that they knew are gone. They just whoosh, disappeared. Friends and relatives. But he's going to go back to Norm as usual. How do I know that? Do you remember what happened on 9-11? What happened on 9-11? Man, for about four weeks, Maybe two months. I'll give it two months. Man, the churches were full. Man, you couldn't find a seat for two months. After two months, what happened? Back to normal. Back to normal. Things returned to normal. Returned to normal. Everyone living life as if nothing had happened. Up to the day that no one entered the ark, no one was concerned about what was going on. Amen? Amen? There have been many people who gave Noah a hard time building the ark for the flood that they didn't believe was possible. Why didn't they believe it was possible? There had never been a flood. In fact, there had never been any rain. How can there be a flood without any rain? See, it hadn't rained to that time. It didn't rain till after the flood. And there are many who do not believe that Jesus is coming back. Those are church folks. In fact, there are many who do not believe that Jesus came the first time. And those are church folks. 
Some of them are seminary professors, I'm sad to say. Because I'm one myself, and I don't believe that. I believe Jesus came the first time, and he's coming the second time. And I teach he came the first time, and he's coming the second time. And I teach it as fact. But there are. And there are more of them that teach that he didn't come the first time. People will not get it until it's too late. In fact, you look at what else was going on in Genesis chapter 6. Turn, in, turn to Genesis chapter 6 in your Bible. Look what was going on. There was a great population explosion in Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. On October 12, 1999, our planet reached the 6 billion mark. And experts tell us that the Earth's population will continue to grow exponentially in the coming years. In Genesis 6, 5, there was a tremendous moral corruption. Every thought of their heart was to do evil continually. Every thought of their heart. Now, it doesn't take a genius to see that we have become desensitized to immorality in our generation. Amen? Since 1960, since 1960, we have become desensitized immorally. More and more and more. There was also violence, Genesis chapter 6, verse 11 and 13. There was an expansion of arts and industry, Genesis chapter 4, 16 through 22. Along with a lack of conscience, even for murder, Genesis chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. And we have beheld an alarming trend in our society when our school-aged children begin shooting one another without any conscience or remorse. And last of all, True believers will become more and more of a minority. I'm talking about born again, blood washed, true believers. How many were on the ark? Eight. Eight. People survived the flood. We are becoming more of a minority. Better way to think about it was Jesus saying was about think about a small town which has a wall around it and has watchmen keeping an eye on what is happening. These watchmen don't know exactly when an enemy is preparing an attack. All they know is that at some point an attack will occur. So they keep watch knowing that their vigilance will help them to be prepared and have an advantage. If they don't keep watch, they will be caught out. Our call is the very same. We know that Jesus will come back. So in the meantime, we keep ourselves in a state of preparedness. It's not so much watching for Jesus, but watching our lives and situations. For number four, because unfaithfulness, unfaithfulness, our unfaithfulness consists of hurting our brother and sister in Christ and living hypocritically and not being ready could jeopardize those who do not know Christ. For the unfaithful, there will be judgment. Amen? There will be judgment. God is specific. If you do not know me, if you do not receive me, if you do not receive the gift that I am offered, you will be judged. And you will be separated from me eternally. 
What that means is that we know that Jesus is coming back. Amen? We know that. Without a doubt. If you believe the Word of God, you know that beyond a doubt. He's coming back. So I need to use that knowledge to spur the spread of the message of hope and forgiveness. I have... Do you understand there's a, there's a terminal disease out there? And I have the only antidote. There is no other antidote. I have it. I've got it. I am the only one who has it. Jesus has given it to me. When I came to know him as Lord and Savior, he gave me the antidote. And he expects me to give that antidote to everyone else who does not have it. I am the only hope for those who do not have the antidote. If I don't give it to them, they cannot get it. I must give them the antidote. Amen? I must. Jesus has placed that precious antidote in my hands. And he has charged me with giving it to those who do not have it. Because the days of evil domination will continue to worsen before he returns. The church will be raptured before the tribulation. The Antichrist will come on the scene. The seven-year tribulation will precede his return. Now, as you notice here, he's talking to the Jews in the 24th chapter there, in the, in the 28th and 29th verses. The Pharisees would, would bear the blame, but they would not bear the blame for all of the injustice that happens to the Jews. And that generation that he's talking about there, yes, he's talking about the generation that is going to be there alive when that temple is destroyed, but the generation that he's talking about is the Jewish generation. And he's talking about that that Jewish generation is also going to be alive, not that specific generation, but the Jews in particular are going to be alive when that Antichrist comes on the scene. And they're going to be alive when Jesus returns. So he's not blaming these Pharisees for all of the injustice of the ages, but he meant that Israel was the nation chosen to be the instrument of God. They were chosen way back, way back through Abraham. They were chosen to be the nation that would teach the whole world what, who God was and what he was like. They were to be the showcase of God. They were to be the virtual showcase of God. They were to show the whole world what God could do with a people if they would trust him and if they would follow him implicitly. If he, they would allow him to work with them and through him, he would bless them with blessings that they could not even believe. And because he would do that for them, he would do that for any other nation or any other people who would turn to him and follow him. They were to be his virtual showcase. But they turned their back on God. And despite the long centuries of hardship and cruelty, they have proved to be an indestructible people. Why? Because even through all of their stuff, God has not abandoned them yet. Amen? God is still with them. That's why any nation who despises them, rejects them, and 
does stuff to them, better watch out. Because they don't know who they're messing with. Now, I'm not saying Israel. I'm saying they're messing with God. Because God is watching over his people. And even through all of that, the fact constitutes the proof that Jesus predicts that what he said will surely come to pass. Amen? So people don't need to know the date. What they need to be ready for is when it happens. We don't need to know a date. Just be ready when it happens. And how you need to be ready? The important thing is that we take from this passage that we need to make sure that as many people as possible are ready to meet him. We need to be about the business of telling others about Jesus Christ. We need to be about helping others to be prepared to meet Jesus. Amen. Because he's coming. He died on Friday, but Sunday was coming. And when Sunday came, he resurrected proving that he was alive. And if you believed in him, he could give you the life that he promised you. That he who lives and believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he who lives and believes in me shall never die. Amen. Amen. That's the message that we've got, folks. We're the only ones who have it. And we need to share it with as many folks as possible. Lord Jesus, as we come to a close, Father, help us to be prepared. Father, help us to be about your business. For we know the time is short. We know you're coming. And Father, help us to be prepared. Help us to be the people of God you desire. Help us to be about your business. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're here and you desire to know him this morning, come and let me pray with you about that decision.